Throughout history, Chicago has been renowned for what's obvious, its towering skyscrapers. But have you ever considered the endless labyrinth of tunnels that lie beneath them? From the Pedway to the 60 miles of freight tunnel or the subway, I'd argue that subterranean Chicago engineering is mind-boggling. And there's more to the story, including the time when Chicago dug miles of tunnel under Lake Michigan itself to access the ominous water cribs, many of which are now abandoned. So from lifting the entire city to reversing the flow of the Chicago River, today we will discover the story of Chicago's waterworks. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. At the time of Chicago's creation, there was basically no system in place to draw water for domestic use. People had to walk over to the lake and bucket water directly. This practice became the source of an abundance of waterborne diseases in Chicago, one of the most prevalent being cholera. And since the people of Chicago would empty their waste into the same water they drank from, outbreaks were destined to happen time and again. But in case you didn't already know, cholera has been a very deadly disease throughout human history, especially before sanitary water systems were widespread. And if left untreated, it can kill a person within a few hours. So after a few cholera outbreaks, citizens arranged Chicago's first public water board in 1851, tasking one William J. McAlpine with drafting plans for a municipal water supply system. A water Water Commission was established and piping was laid for domestic water and fire hydrants in most areas susceptible to fire or diseases. This included the central business district, but also some of the more poorer residential areas. However, the effort was to little avail as Chicago had a much more severe issue. At the time, the entire city was basically a swamp. You see, Chicago was built on an extremely low water table, being practically parallel to the Chicago River. As a consequence, any time that there was any kind of wet weather, the whole city would find itself engulfed in mud as the dirt streets were drenched with fresh rainfall. Streets would become impassable, basements would flood, and the lack of drainage would pose serious problems, not just for commuters, but to public health, as human waste within the washes came directly up to people's front doors, creating something of a citywide cesspool, a breeding ground for parasites and diseases. Hence, in 1855, a drastic decision was made to raise the streets of Chicago four to 14 feet above Lake Michigan's water level. And yes, they meant literally lifting up the city. The process involved placing jacks underneath the buildings and having dozens of workers turn the screws unanimously, eventually lifting the building up to their desired heights. From there, sewage and water systems could be installed. Needless to say, this process was extremely inconvenient to pedestrians, and yet several businesses claimed to have seen increased foot traffic with people being drawn in by the novelty of the building being lifted. Most impressively, the buildings were completely undamaged by this process. The work was carried out with such precision that the people inside of the buildings would barely even notice any motion when the jacks were being turned. The process of lifting Chicago would take 20 years to complete, but vastly enhanced the comfort and sanitary conditions of the city. During this phase of change, or new elevations, the Water Commission extended the water pipes, initially laying pipes just for the sake of public health and safety, but by 1864 they had begun refusing installations in areas that water rent would not turn a profit, meaning that sanitation was becoming a luxury in some areas. Property holders had to cover the cost for the extension of water pipes, so poor buildings would typically only have a single tap to be shared by all residents. The need for a better water infrastructure would go noticed again in 1865, at the end of the American Civil War, as Chicago was hit with a massive wave of growth and industrialization. In turn, the city experienced another uptick of waterborne diseases, with cholera once again taking center stage. So the city developed another solution to this problem, this time in the form of underground tunnels 
beneath Lake Michigan. The plan was seriously ambitious. Tunnels would be dug underneath one of the world's largest lakes to access circular stone structures called water cribs, which were constructed offshore. Initially, these cribs were floating wooden structures that would be filled with rubble and then equipped it with protective barriers to secure the structures against ship or ice collisions. Then, tunnels would be dug underneath the lake entirely by hand, going at a pace of about 15 feet per day, until finally completed. Several commenters, stunned at the progress and scale of the project, declared that the tunnelers were the best in the world, making the tunneling of the Thames River in Britain look like the work of a child. Imagine their shock when 30 years later, the tunnels needed to be doubled in size. At the height of the project, nine total cribs were constructed. These cribs obviously needed to be maintained, and up until the 1990s, so-called crib tenders would live out on them in the lake. Taking week-long shifts, they would clear debris, fish from the vents, and use hand tools or dynamite to prevent the freezing of water over the cribs. This job did not come without risk, as storms were always a possibility, but there was also an incident of fire as recalled by the Chicago Tribune. Fire more than a mile offshore sent dozens of men jumping into Lake Michigan in a desperate attempt to escape death and harm, only to encounter the same in the lake's icy water, the one that caught fire on the morning of January the 20th, 1909, was just a temporary structure in use while a tunnel for the water transportation was being built. This intermediate crib about 1.5 miles from the shore around 71st Street on the south side was made of wood made strong enough to withstand the waves and ice, but in no sense fireproof, a fact that proved fatal. Exactly how many men were working on the crib when the disaster struck was unclear from the start. The crib had sleeping and eating accommodation for 90 men. As a rule, there were 80 men employed there divided into three shifts, and work went on night and day, according to the Tribune. It's not likely that the exact number of dead will ever be known, the Tribune reported the day after the disaster. George W. Jackson, president of the company building the tunnel, furnished the list of 79 names as the role of the men employed on the crib. However, 47 bodies had been recovered at that point, while 48 men had been rescued, already surpassing the number of names on the list and the 90-person capacity of the structure. Those who escaped the fiery crib had to grapple with the icy waters of Lake Michigan while waiting for rescue, and they weren't fully clothed as the fire had struck while they were sleeping. The Tribune report described the horrifying choice that the men faced as the fire spread and the panic and confusion sent them scrambling. The most probable cause of the fire was a drop torch or a mishap with dynamite that was kept to de-ice the crib. Anyhow, as time went on, more methods of water extraction came about and the cribs became more and more obsolete. The tunnels were demolished one by one. Today, there are only two active cribs, but they've both been automated. The rest have been demolished, scheduled for demolition, or rendered unusable due to tunnel collapses. But don't worry, the story of Chicago's tunnels are not yet over, and we will return to them later in the story. So now that the water was flowing, one might ask, to where? And how would it be kept? An answer to be provided by architect William W. Boynton. In the form of an 18-story tall water tower completed in 1869, the Chicago Water Tower is a beautiful piece of architecture designed with a Gothic Revival facade. Uh, I mean, facade. Anyhow, the sole purpose was to hide a standpipe, and yet despite this simple purpose, its design truly emphasizes the importance of the water supply to the city of Chicago and its citizens. But the fact that this tower is still standing is something of a miracle. In 1871, a barn fire on the southwest side of the city escalated into an enormous citywide fire that burned for over a full day, killing 300 people and displacing a third of the city's residents by destroying their homes. 
the Great Chicago Fire of 71 was an extremely important event in the city's history and a defining moment in the history of the Chicago Water Tower. You see, during the fire's rampage throughout the city, much of its gothic decorations were destroyed. Many Chicagoans believed it was damaged beyond repair, and as a result, it was mostly abandoned. Though the destruction was not the only reason for this abandonment, as by the 1900s it had become technically obsolete and discontinued from the waterworks of the city in 1911. In 1913, the city attempted to restore the tower as it was a nasty eyesore in a very central district, but the project failed, so the city eventually proposed to move the water tower and clear the location for new street connections. This should have been easy enough. I mean, Chicago was no stranger to lifting and moving buildings, as several buildings had also been moved elsewhere during the rising of Chicago, but the water tower was in such a fragile state that any attempt to move it would have simply resulted in this masterpiece toppling over to its demise. This revelation spurred the completion of a restoration project on site, with street traffic rerouted around the tower, as it stands to modern day. So, with the story of Chicago's water tower at a close, let's turn back to the late 1800s. Even with all these improvements and projects, cholera still hadn't had its fill with Chicago just yet. On August the 2nd, 1885, a storm dumped a massive five and a half inches of rain on Chicago, causing much of the waste on the streets to end up in the river and then into Lake Michigan. But luckily, due to low temperatures and winds, most of the sewage was carried out further into the lake and away from water collection sites. Though it was certainly a great point of fear for Chicagoans, the potential disease of the epidemic was not lost on the populace. In fact, a myth began circulating that the August storm actually did cause an epidemic that killed 90,000 people. However, that would have been 12% of Chicago's population at the time, and would have been such a gruesome event that it would have received worldwide news coverage, and yet it's mostly unknown. Had this event taken place as described, the mortality rate would have been comparable to a breakout of the Black Death. And as a breakout of that size did not occur, it was very reflective of the fears of disease in Chicago at the time, so another major step needed to take place. As a response to the epidemic, the Chicago City Council decided to permanently reverse the flow of the Chicago River in 1887. This way, an epidemic of that mythical size could never happen. Well, at least not in Chicago. Anyhow, in May of 1889, the Sanitary District of Chicago was founded with the purpose of managing the city's water supply, but more prevalently to spearhead the River Reversal Project. The plan was to create a canal connecting Lake Michigan to the Des Plaines River, which flowed downhill. As a result, the Chicago River would flow in the opposite direction. So construction began on the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, also known as the Main Channel, on September the 3rd, 1892, but this project was not without major concerns. In 1895, a federal commission looked into the effect that the channel might have on the lake and harbor water levels, claiming that the project could potentially lower the Great Lakes water level supply by six inches, drastically affecting the water systems in other cities built on the lake. This would come to be known as the Lake Levels Controversy and would impede construction. To those of you who do not live near the Great Lakes, it might not seem like a big deal. However, once you consider that the lakes and their watershed contain nearly one-fifth of the surface freshwater on the planet, with around 40 million people in the United States and Canada today relying upon them, one city skimming even an inch off the top could have profound effects, as that could easily mean an obscenely large amount of fresh water being dumped directly into the ocean. Several states, including Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin brought lawsuits to the city, attempting to restrain it from diverting even a drop of water. Even cities in Canada got involved through the International Waterways Commission, arguing that the growing industry and Chicago's continued expansion would push the channel system to a breaking point, requiring yet another diversion and more lowering of the water levels. 
Downriver, cities and residents of the Illinois River Basin had gripes with the reversal. In particular, they were not exactly keen on receiving the wastewaters of one of America's most polluted cities, believing it would pose a threat to the water supply of not just the Illinois River, but the entirety of the Mississippi River. Regardless of the lawsuits, Chicago was determined and construction went ahead. Workers digging out the main channel removed 26 million cubic yards of glacial drift and 12 million cubic yards of solid rock, which was the largest earth-moving project in history at the time. The channel was constructed in three sections. Firstly, an earth section between Damon Avenue and Summit. Secondly, an earth and rock section between Summit and Willow Springs. And third, a rock section from Willow Springs to Lockport, with the rock section being 40% larger than the other two sections. Though it was scheduled for completion in 1896, the project would continue for another four years, as more time was needed to dig out the canal and throughout the duration, the lawsuits continued dragging on, with disputes between contractors and the sanitary district not accelerating the process. But by January the 2nd, 1900, the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal was completed, with the dams quietly opened to avoid backlash from litigating parties. From that day, the Chicago River began to flow southwards along to the Displains River. The operation was a success as immediately the death rate from typhoid and other waterborne illnesses dropped by 80%. Missouri attempted to get the U.S. Supreme Court to enjoin Illinois and the Sanitary District of Chicago from releasing their sewage into the new canal, but with little success. The canal was open and the waste would flow away from Chicago forever. With the rapid growth of Chicago, the single dam quickly became inadequate so the city would aggressively take measures to power their waterworks in the following decades. In 1907, a project to extend the main channel another four miles was completing, allowing for the creation of a water power plant. In 1909, the Willow Springs Spillway was completed, allowing for more water from the Des Plaines River to flow into the main channel, which in turn increased productivity of the power plant. In 1910, creation of another canal the North Shore Channel was completed, flushing wastewater from north of the Chicago River down into the main channel. In 1922, yet another channel was built after 11 years of excavation, also sending the now-reversed Calumet River into the main channel. This added more fresh water to the Chicago River, diluting the wastewater and adding yet more power to the plant. As all was now well for Chicagoans, Neighbors were still seriously annoyed, so the sanitary district would hear from the Supreme Court once again, and this time there was call for consequence. In the late 1920s, the court began the process of reducing the annual average net diversion from Lake Michigan, basically meaning that flushing your toilet into the river was no longer going to fly. This change was to be instituted over the course of eight years and forced Chicago to set up treatment plans for the recycling of wastewater. So in 1922, the Calumet Sewage Treatment Works began operations, followed by the North Side Water Works in 1928, the West Side Water Works in 1931, and the Southwest Works in 1939. As time went on, more plants were added to keep up with the region's growth, and by 1970, Chicago's wastewater treatment facility facilities were the largest and most efficient in the world, and the inhabitants downriver were no longer burdened with dirty sewage. The 1970s saw the water cribs becoming increasingly obsolete and plagued with breakdowns, so it was clear that further action was needed. And almost as a finale to all those massive projects we've covered in this video, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago began the Tunnel and Reservoir Plan in 1972, a plan monumental to never-before-seen scales. This plan was drafted as a cost-efficient way to comply with both federal 
and state water quality standards throughout all 375 square miles of Chicago, as well as the 51 nearby suburb sewer area, with its primary goal being to protect Lake Michigan from sewage pollution. Basically, outlets for street and basement wastewater would lead into miles of cavernous tunnels, diverting sewage in the event of backup or flooding. This would have far-reaching ramifications with water quality beyond the lake to rivers and streams, TARP, as it's known, began tunnel construction in 1975 and entered into use in 1981. But this was only a baby step. The work ahead, and the work that is still ongoing to modern day, would be one of the largest civil engineering projects in the history of the world. So let me tell you about the project's phases. Phase 1 is intended for pollution control, being made up of four gigantic tunnel systems, Mainstream, Displains, Calumet, and Upper Displains. After wet weather, pumps drain out the tunnel systems, sending the contents to treatment plants and opening space for the next storm. Water is treated and then sent back into the network for human consumption. Phase 2 of TARP involves several reservoirs to control flooding, though they can also be used for pollution control thanks to the actions of Phase 1. There are currently three reservoirs proposed for Phase 2, the Gloria Alito Maevsky, McCook, and Thornton Reservoir. Construction for the McCook Reservoir is still underway, being scheduled for completion in 2029. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, did he just say that the whole thing started in the 1970s and it's still under construction? Yes, you're correct. And that is only because the scale of these tunnels and reservoirs is basically insane. This tunnel system is massive. It makes Chicago's freight tunnels look like a joke. Once completed, there will be a network of 109 miles of tunnel, ranging from 9 to 33 feet in diameter, and as deep as 350 feet below the surface. By the time the McCook Reservoir is completed, TARP will have been in effect for 57 years. The water supply of Chicago has a very long and storied history dating all the way back to the mid-19th century. And for anyone who grew up around Chicago, the idea that the remaining water cribs are awaiting demolition might invoke a touch of nostalgia. But this is often the only outcome of urban decay. And as time goes on, even the newest projects, like TARP, will become obsolete, abandoned, and forgotten. It's only really a question of time. That's it for this episode. Check out my playlist about Chicago's other forgotten tunnels and subscribe to its history for more tales of urban decay. This is Ryan Sokash, signing off.